All right, well, it's almost seven o'clock. Um, somebody signal that they they uh, hear us here. Mike sounds, uh, sounds great. Uh, Drew, you hear me? Yep. Good, good, Drew. Um, well, why don't we get started? I'm here with Karen and Hans over at Children's to start our 2022-2023 um, teaching series. Um, I've been doing these for about 45 years, and it, as I was driving over here this morning, I realized how remiss I was in all the years I've known Hans as a friend and a colleague and clearly the leading immunologist in our city, if not the leading immunologist in our country, that I've never had him as a speaker before. And so actually we're all honored to have him as the, the first speaker of this year. He's going to give us reminiscence and his career of the development of the field of immunology and specifically immunodeficiency diseases. Uh, we have an international audience. I see that David Hagen in Tel Aviv is listening. Um, so I, again, I'm just honored that Hans accepted my invitation to be our speaker this morning. He's got a lot to tell us, so I'm gonna let let him get started and we have a large audience for him. Uh, they, they are not going to see me, do they? I, that's not no, necessary. Good, good, slide. Yeah, good morning. So uh, thank you, uh, Len, for introduction. Uh, we indeed go back way uh, before uh, Len's laboratory got on fire at the University of Washington. How many years are that? 50? <laughs> Uh, many of them don't know of that event. Uh, yeah, uh, let's forget about that. Yes. So, so I, I wanted to uh, give you a little uh, uh, food for thought or thought for food. No, not me. Uh, related to immunology and immunodeficiency. So I was a fellow in 1969 to 72 with Ralph Wedgwood, Starkey Davis, and uh, um, uh, realized that you really need good mentors. And uh, to the question of how do you rub shoulders with the immortals, uh, with you know, the famous individuals when you are a fellow, and there is the answer. You hang out with them, go where they are. You learn their qualities and their strengths and weaknesses and uh, I get them in, in, interested in the kind of research. And that what happened to me, uh, Bob Good got interested in my research and uh, he fostered me for the entire fellowship. Uh, then when you need it, you ask a letter of recommendation. And I have to tell you, I had one recommendations letter from, uh, from a, um, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Don Thomas, uh, which helped me a lot to, to make it to a full professor. And then uh, don't forget them when they are out on pasture. You know, I have met many of my old friends who were abandoned and alone. No conflict to disclose. And I should also tell you uh, to mute yourself, uh, which is a rule in this uh, um, talk here. So uh, I was asked to put the word of the day, which is welcome. And uh, I figured out that it was created by the organizers to track you, so be careful. A better word of the day, I think, would be bear witness of the conception, the embryonic development, birth and infancy of our field immunology by rubbing shoulders virtually and in person with some of the greatest characters on the stage of science. Wait and see and speculate what the teenage years of immunology will be like. Uh, you will witness them in the next 50 years. And then, uh, you no, know, I like to go into history. So as always, the Greeks hit it right. And there was a young Athenian, um, he was a general already, and his name Thucydides described the plaque of Athens, which was something like 2,430 years ago. And he stated, 
with another statement was, uh, you know, I will write it down because the people who come after me, they will understand what this plaque is all around. And then he said, I came down with the plaque, survived, and now can take care of the sick. Since when you had it once, you will not get it again. That was genetics 101. He didn't use the word immunology and immune protection, but he got it right. And then he said, Pericles, my mentor, got the disease and died. And then I looked it up. Thucydides was 32 years and Pericles was 62, exactly like we uh, have been witnessing during COVID. And then the concept of acquired immunity, uh, there was nothing for a long time until the Ottoman Turks started to practice variolation. And variolation was introduced to England by Mary Wortley Montag. And who was she? She was the wife of uh, the ambassador of Great Britain to uh, the Ottomans in Istanbul. And she introduced uh, this variolation to England after a successful royal experiment. She told her friend, the daughter of the king, that uh, she had her two kids variolated in Istanbul. Uh, but uh, but uh, the, the king didn't really want that done right away. So he asked for uh, a consultation from his physicians and they made a, a clinical experiment with 12 prisoners and 12 orphans. And they, they were variolated and then they exposed, not the orphans were not exposed, but the prisoners were exposed to, uh, to uh, smallpox and they all were protected and none of them got in trouble with the immunization. So the variolation was introduced in England and it was done all over the world. It was for instance done in Boston uh, before uh, the next episode of uh, immunity, which was done by Edward Jenner. Some 50 years later in 1796, as you know, he introduced vaccination, not variolation. Vaccination, where does it come from? Come from, from VACA, because he used cowpox. And so vac vaccination should be actually <laughs> reversed for, uh, reserved for uh, the vaccination of smallpox, not against uh, uh, COVID-19. Then, of course, it followed. People started scientific research into immunization. Pasteur, they, he created the rabies vaccine using the brains of infected rabbits. And Koch, he tried, after he discovered the TB bacillus, he tried to immunize and he used uh, tuberculin. And at that time, no, everybody had TB. So he, he injected tuberculin into himself and his girlfriend and they almost died because of, the, of a overwhelming reaction to a tuberculin, which is, you know, it's what you use to identify people who have been in, infected with TB in a, in a, in a skin test. And then uh, came von Behring and Kitasado. Here you see uh, von Behring with his Atlatus in his office working with guinea pigs. And what he discovered was that blood of immunized rabbits can destroy tetanus toxin. And how did he do it? He gave them small amount of toxin, less than killing them. And then they became immune. Or he could then, he, he in order to make toxo, uh, uh, toxoid, he actually used blood from immunized rabbits and mixed it with toxin and then injected that. And that was the first toxoid, not to kill the uh, vaccine with uh, the toxin of tetanus. And then he no found that the serum and extravascular fluid have the same property and the effect is lasting and it can be transferred by blood or serum transfusion. So he really identified active and passive immunization. And then comes really my idol here. A, a, uh, he was a Prussian Jewish physician who in 1899 uh, got the idea of antibody. And here you can see on the right side, you can, you can see uh, the cells 
which have receptors. And those would be, in present days, these would be B cells who have the antigen receptors. And now if the antigen comes, it will induce the cell, which would be a B cell, to now uh, recognize this and produce these uh, antibodies uh, more and more and secrete it. And you have a, a immune system of B cells. And for that, actually, without knowing exactly that, 150 years later, we would know exactly how this thing works. He got the Nobel Prize. And then uh, there are a number of conspirators uh, who um, were active in providing IgG replacement. And one of the first in that line is Arne Tiselius, who invented electrophoresis in 1931. Now you could actually differentiate the plasma into gamma globulin fraction and alpha and beta. Then came Edwin Korn. Uh, he started a plasma fractionation during World War II in order to, uh, to get uh, albumin uh, for the front, the soldiers. And he had an interesting, uh, he must have been able to, to speak German, he had a, a sign in his office in Boston, which quoted Goethe's Faust saying, Blut ist ein ganz besonderer Saft, which means blood is a very special juice. And then uh, it was recognized in Boston with co collaborators from Edwin Cohn that the antibodies that provide active and passive immunity are in the gamma globulin fraction. And that became fraction two, which was then used later on as uh, protection for measles. And in 1953, the, treat the first X-linked a gamma globulinemia, a gamma globulinemia patient by Bruton. And that's what Bruton did. He injected uh, this uh, fraction two uh, into his IgG deficient patient. And then came a bunch of Swiss who really worked on the IVIG. And there is Silvio Barandun, which I knew very well, but first, uh, with, his, uh, with him, uh, my shoulders, Andreas Morel and Alfred Hassig. And they created the first acceptable IVIG preparation, in contrast to Korn, who provided, provided the Korn fraction two for subcutaneous immunoglobulin treatment. And there is what Tiselius apparatus shows you. Uh, it, it, uh, it pro it, you. You use electricity and the size of the proteins. And so you have your gamma globulin, your beta, your alpha, and your albumin. Uh, Charles Janeway was probably one of the first immunologists who worked with patients uh, together at the same time like Bruton. Uh, he uh, introduced gamma globulin a source of antibodies. Uh, and uh, he trained, for instance, Walter Hitzig, who became uh, the imminent immunologist in Switzerland. And that is one of my other uh, idols, uh, Bob Good. You can see him teaching. He was one of the best teachers I ever noticed. Uh, he also was very successful in creating young immunologists who worked with him. So uh, his so called Bob Good's good guys, uh, which he induced to work with him. So uh, he uh, started a primary immune deficiency center in Minneapolis in the 50s. Uh, and what's important, he was one of the most successful mentors for students. With Max Kuber, uh, uh, he discovered the role of the bursa and the thymus, the dual uh, immunological uh, concept of B cells and T cells, which would be adaptive and cognate immunity. He worked uh, with um, uh, Max Cooper to identify that Viscott Aldrich syndrome is in fact a primary immune deficiency diseases. With a guy named Pedersen, he discovered that ataxia telangiectasia is a primary immune deficiency. With Paul Quee, uh, he uh, discovered that in CGD, the phagocytes cannot kill. And then with his student Gatti, he did the first successful hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for SCID. And with Mary Anthony's, with Marianne South, he discovered IgA deficiency. 
And so that is this dual system of B and T cells. They recognize that if you irradiated the thymus, you get you got a T cell deficiency with T cell depletion and impaired allograft rejection. And if he irradiated or eliminated the uh, bursa of Fabricius, these animals had no longer germinal centers and could not make antibodies. And so T cells are where they discovered. That was one of my first research projects was to identify T cells with sheep red cells. So you can see a T cell that is coated with sheep red cells and that uh, or lymphocyte and that were called T cells. And on the right side, you see two of them. And I studied these uh, T cells in almost any kind of immune deficiency I had access to as, as a, a fellow. Anska, I've never known why rosettes of sheep red blood cells, why was that, whoever worked because at that system? It, that, that was a guy named Fudenberg, who was uh, one of the first who identified the, the, the fact that T cells have a receptor for sheep red cells if they are T cells. It's just random that that's, that's the it, case. It, it, yeah, that's uh, and that was that was for several years was the only way to identify T cells, and and so of course this this is a real rosette uh, that is from La Chapelle in uh, in Paris. But that's why they call this rosetting. And here you see Bob Good with some of uh, his. Uh, friends um, in the middle, uh, the gray-haired is Walter Hitzig, who uh, I, who discovered uh, Skid, and then on the right side, uh, uh, the smiling younger guy, uh, he is Gatti, who with Bob Good performed the first uh, uh, bone marrow transplantation, successful transplantation in in the world, actually. And, and uh, uh, Walter Hitzig, he described these patients. And here you see a child ha that has generalized vaccinia. And those, those were identified in the United States as having a, a, a peculiar reaction to smallpox and were sent to Denver to, uh, uh, to um, a guy named Kemp, who uh, was an infection uh, specialists and was asked by the government to figure out why these patients uh, essentially died from these smallpox vaccine. Uh, and uh, he realized first that they didn't have antibodies. They had no gamma globulin. So he went and gave them gamma globulin. It didn't work. Then he noticed that these patients also were lymphopenic. So what did he do? He went to the blood bank, got Buffy code and injected it into these patients. And he wrote, a, he wrote a report. He didn't know what happened, but retrospectively, he created graft versus host disease. Because these patients, he describes it very beautifully with Fulgenetti. He said, no, I gave them the, 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 the Buffy code, and within the first five days, they got markedly better. And then they de developed a rash diarrhea and died. And he, he described it, he didn't know what it was. And it was, of course, classic uh, uh, non-compatible uh, bone marrow that killed these patients. And I know you all know skits. Uh, that was the way uh, Walter Hitzig de de described them as lymphopenic. Uh, they had a small thymus, uh, early onset, and they got all kinds of infection from bacterial to fungal and uh, diarrhea and early death. And there is, is a thymus. This is a, a thymus from an ADA deficient patient. Most, most of these patients had very small thymuses because they were, and except for the George, where the thymus was a problem, all the others had T cell problems and they just did not populate the thymus. So the thymus unlucky was there, but the thymus did not populate. And that brought us to Elo Giblet, a Seattleite, which I uh, admired and uh, we were friends, she discovered the first genetic immune deficiency. Um, and there is what she saw. So there was a guy uh, with the name of Moiwiesen in Albany. And he heard about uh, Bob, he was also a, a student of Bob Good. He heard about the successful transplant. So he wanted to transplant a girl who had skid by the definition I just showed you. 
but there and and you had to they had very primitive HLA typing procedure. One was a serum, and the other one was mixed leukocyte uh, culture. And you tried to find a family member, a sibling who was matched. So it just didn't figure out. They matched the parents and the siblings, and so they wanted to know more about this relationship and they sent a blood sample to Elo Giblet who used ADA as a polymorphic protein. And you can see on the left side in right, row number one, uh, that's a normal control. And there are three, uh, if, you, if you electrophoresis, it, you, you get three bands. And uh, this, the second one, there was nothing. She didn't see any, any protein. And then three and four, were uh, the biologic parents. And on the fifth line was actually the legal father. The legal father was normal, as you can see. And so the question is three, line three and four. Line three was a mother and line four was the grandfather. So the interpretation was, you know, that that could be genetics and maybe the grandfather is the biologic father and they confronted the family and that is actually true. So you can see here, and that must have been a homozygous ADA deficiency between a consanguous uh, a, a relationship. And so, uh, but she, the most important thing was that she realized that this patient itself had no protein. And that was the first genetically determined uh, uh, skid uh, uh, disease. So uh, in ADA deficiency, I just wanted to uh, point out to you, uh, there are metabolic abnormalities and it's in fact a metabolic disease. So uh, uh, the oxyadenosine is high in the plasma and the red cells have, a, have no ADA, but a lot of deoxyATP which interferes with uh, the DNA synthesis. And so actually, you know, pro uh, pro proliferating cells die out because they, they cannot uh, duplicate their DNA. And uh, fibroblasts have no ADA, other tissue. And the interesting thing is like bones. So these, these, these babies, ADA deficient, unless they get transplanted, are actually dwarfs. And for ADA deficiency or no, you don't put the baby in a bubble. Uh, but you, you can have uh, successful bone marrow transplantation, fully matched, uh, enzyme replacement uh, with PEG-ADA or gene therapy, uh, which has been very successful in ADA deficiency. And there, that is the bubble which I referred to. Uh, that was a, a, a clinical trial in Houston to put David, the patient, into a bubble right after birth. They knew that this was excellent skit in the family. And so this, this poor kid was kept in a bub bubble until he was a teenager. And, and you see here, uh, this, this is uh, his physician who greets him through the plastic by holding his, his hand. And Davis was, uh, they, they, um, he had a sister who was matched, he was transplanted, but uh, his sister, which was a teenager had EBV and so, uh, uh, he got EBV infection and uh, lymphocyte proliferation and died after transplantation. You had it. No, I'm just looking at our audience, John. I'll, okay. The, and, the biggest audience we've ever had. And so here you see a long-term set of survivors of dogs, which Don Thomas used to work out scientifically hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, heterologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in the 60s. And once he knew this, how to do it in dogs, he went in humans. And I remember as a fellow, he came, he came to Ralph Wedgwood and Ralph said, you know, there's this hematologist, uh, Don Thomas, he comes in, why don't you sit in? Uh, he wants to talk about bone marrow transplantation. And so came Don Thomas uh, with Rhino Storp. Uh, we were sitting in, 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 in the library at, at the university. And Don Thomas' first question was, Ralph, how many skits do you get a year? And Ralph said, oh, well, maybe one every five years. And I saw Don Thomas' jaw drop. And then he changed his strategy and went into leukemia and then aplastic anemia. 
and successfully treated this patient. I, as, a, as a fellow, I, I studied his, these dogs immunologically, the immune reconstitution and the third and, and his third group of survival. And the interesting thing is out of his 10, 10 first transplantations in leukemia, nine died. And he continued and uh, there was no stop. So, uh, you know, he got the Nobel Prize. And that's, that's a real chimera. Again, a, it shows you that there are lions and there are goats uh, and, the, and, and the tail of a... Of a so it's a, it's a multiple um, animal, an animal with multiple species. And again, uh, there I wanted to point out that successful bone marrow transplantation goes back to Bob Good. And this is uh, um, uh, Gatti later on in, in the middle to the left is uh, the first patient successfully transplanted from his sister, which is uh, on the right and his mother is all on the right. And so that is at the age of 19, uh, completely immunologically reconstituted. Another uh, transplant uh, hero is Becky Buckley, who uh, doggedly uh, transplanted, uh, also first a very unsuccessful, and then she learned how to, how to use mismatched by depleting T cells uh, with she bread cells, using or setting, uh, depleting it and successfully treated, uh, treated not completely matched uh, uh, skid patients. And then I wanted to show uh, you uh, Bob in his old years, you know, and he was not forgotten. Uh, he, he lived uh, in, in uh, Florida his last few years, and here you see him being visited by Max Cooper, uh, the two of them uh, uh, deciding on the two compartment uh, um, uh, B and T cell uh, immune system. And that's uh, my mentor, Ralph Wedgwood. He uh, connected immunodeficiency with autoimmunity. He was actually a rheumatologist and he discovered Job syndrome in the sixties. And there is, uh, on the left hand is uh, his paper, Job syndrome. And he described these two patients on the right uh, uh, as redheaded uh, girls and didn't know anything about genetics because it was just a spontaneous uh, um, um, disease. And both of these girls died. The top one, Karen, she died uh, as a, at the age of 18 of uh, chronic lung disease. And uh, the, the uh, lower one, uh, uh, Becky, she died uh, at the age of 53, also of chronic lung disease. And so these redheaded girls, this was of course, a, just a pure, a pure uh, coincidence that they, but uh, then uh, this, uh, this lady in, in, uh, in the, uh, on the bottom on this uh, slide, she uh, got married and had two affected boys from two different fathers. And so we knew after that, these pregnancies, that this was a dominant uh, disease and that these were always new, uh, new mutations happening in, in uh, the parent, the, health, the healthy parent. So her, her, her uh, dad or her mother had a spontaneous mutation in either the sperm or in the egg. And then she uh, had a, um, a dominant uh, uh, negative uh, mutation in STAR3, which she passed on her two boys. Now let's look a little bit about B cells because that is really a historic story uh, that um, uh, influenced uh, the field of immune deficiency greatly. Here you see the de development of B cells from pre-B cells to plasma cells. And there are a number of genes that are required to go through that maturation process. And BTK, Putin's tyrosine kinase, is very important to get from the pro-B cells to the B cells and, and plasma cells. And these patients were recognized uh, relatively early 
uh, in the 50s as having recurrent bacterial sinopulmonary infections. They can get chronic recurrent gastroenteritis either due to a col uh, colitis or due to infections with Giardia. And uh, uh, in the form of a gamma globulinemia due to BTK mutations, you can got you can develop chronic enteroviral meningoencephalitis. And before we had IVIG, about 30% of these patients developed this, this complications uh, with enteroviral infections and mostly died. And then they have often arthritis and develop bronchiectasis. And there you can see that dual system of T and B cells, how they interact with each other. Uh, you can see uh, genes like CD40 ligand, CD40 that uh, are expressed either by uh, T cells or, or B cells that are required for normal antibody production. And if you have a mutation in CD40 ligand or CD40, you get a hypo IgM syndrome. Uh, if you have no BTK, uh, which is a kinase, uh, you cannot uh, develop B cells. So it's a very intricate interaction uh, using also lymphokines and chemokines to result in normal T cell functions and normal B cell function with a high hypo, hypo mutated uh, IgG and IgG sub I, I, uh, and IgG isotype antibodies. And so the basic structure was discovered when I was a fellow uh, by Edelman and Porter, who uh, used enzymes to digest this complicated protein, IgG, as you can see, that has two heavy chains and two light chains. And by using papain or pepsin, they could split that molecule into FIB fragments and the FC fragment, which is a crystal, crystallable uh, fragment, and uh, eventually uh, got to recognize this uh, IgG molecule consisting of the antigen binding site and the FCC site. And uh, uh, also later on, how these structures are, make this molecule uh, such long living with a half-life of uh, you know, 28 to 30 days. And that's how I measured as a fellow IgG with uh, radial immunodiffusion. And those were slides that had argo, and there was an antibody against IgG. And then you put the serum, you diluted it serially and put it in, and you had a standard, and you measured the size of that circle. And as more uh, antibody there was in, it has, in order to, to precipitate the IgG, the IgG antibody in the argo, you have to have a certain dilution. And as more antibody is in there, IgG is in there, as big as the circle goes. So that was very tedious, but you could estimate the IgG levels based on this radial immunodiffusion. And then of course came, came uh, immu immune, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, um, way we, we do it now uh, much more effectively. Now, the discovery of a gamma globulinemia uh, by Bruton was, uh, was highlighted by Bob Good. So Bob Good uh, knew about it, invited um, um, Bruton to dis describe his discovery. And so uh, you know, I witnessed this story. And so he, he uh, discovered uh, this XLA in 1953 and uh, uh, su successfully treated this patient with sub subcutaneous injections of IgG. And that's when, uh, when uh, one of the co-discover of BTK in the middle, Edward Smith visited Bruton uh, in uh, 1993, he was in a wheelchair. And Edward Smith told me an interesting story. Uh, he congratulated uh, uh, Bruton for his discovery, and, uh, uh, and Putin said, yeah, you know, I, I went uh, to Boston and uh, we talked it over and I presented the case. And then his wife said, yeah, well, you went, yes, you went to Boston and they hoodwinked you. And they said, okay, we have similar patients. Why don't we uh, publish it together? <laughs> and you came home and I told you, don't discover, don't, don't publish it with uh, these big shots in Boston. You will be the last one. 
uh, it's, uh, publish it yourself. And so that's why actually this, this kinase is called Bruton's diocene kinase. And so that is a story uh, which he told uh, in a meeting when Bob Good asked him uh, uh, before dinner to explain how he discovered a gamma globulinemia. And I asked him about what I am supposed to do at this meeting. I had never met Dr. Good before. And he looked at me and, it's, and he said, we want the world to know how a simple clinical pediatrician could have discovered this disease. And I wish you would tell us just how you did it. And so he, you know, he went on as he was an army pet, uh, uh, a pediatrician, and uh, you know, he said, uh, "Well, to read is the end, and all the the uh, unsolved cases are sent to uh, Walter Reed. There is nowhere else to pass a buck after Walter Reed, so I had to solve their problem as best as I could." And so he said, "A boy was admitted to Walter Reed uh, with." with uh, uh, the diagnosis of rheumatic fever because of a hot left knee. He was treated with penicillin successfully, but two weeks later, he came back with a case of sepsis, testing positive for pneumococcus. This repeated 19 times. The Walter Reed Institute had a new machine that could fractionate proteins, a Tiselius moving boundary machine. Someone suggested that with this boy having permanent and serious infections, that he should have a high gamma globulin level. So I asked them if they could send up some of the boy's serum. They said they would be delighted. I sent them the blood, but the next day the technician called to tell me that something was wrong with the machine, that it showed the boy as having no gamma globulin. She asked me to send another sample, which I did. And that's how, how it shows the normal on the top. You see that gamma globulin fraction uh, and the, in the middle, the boy. And then after treating him uh, with subcutaneous fraction two, you can see that it's uh, no very uh, poor, poor quality, but you can see some elevation of the gamma globulin fraction. Uh, the next sample said the, the same thing, that the boy had no gamma globulin. Then it clicked. No gamma globulin meant to no ability to build antibodies. And then he uh, treated him appropriately. Uh, now, why did Bob Good not get the Nobel Prize? So select, select one of the following. With over 2,000 publications, no one wanted to nominate him. Or the committee, the committee, the Nobel Committee could not agree on his most important contribution. A black felt pen, a black spotted mouse, and a dermatologist blew it. Okay. He treated the Shah of Persia, Persia for lymphoma. <laughs> Too many wives. <laughs> he had three of them. He co-authored three papers with a former World War II adversary, which was me, and he was not from Boston. So, so you got it. This was, this was a scandal which was called a, a medical Watergate by the New York Times in 1974. And there was his trusted uh, uh, fellow, which I met, William Summerlin, who painted the mice. That, that is, became a sort of a, a, a logo, uh, painting the mice, in an attempt to show that he had solved the problem of allogeneic transplantation. So Summerling was fired and Bob Good had to leave Sloan Kettering Institute and went after going to several places, ended up in Florida. Uh, okay, uh, XLA, uh, which I call here the first clinically defined PID or uh, uh, you know, a, a biography here. Of, so, so these patients, as I mentioned, uh, know they had bacterial infections and they all died in infancy of pneumonia. Um, Tiselius apparatus was instrumental to show that they had no, no gamma globulin uh, and then came immunolectophoresis. They had no IgG, no IgM, no IgA. Uh, and then later on, when we could uh, identify B cells by flow, uh, having uh, antibodies that recognize B cells, they had no B cells, but they had normal T cells. And uh, XLA specific infections, Pseudomonas, Helicobacter, Giardia, 
and enteroviral and other viruses uh, can cause problems. And, and they have mutations in BTK, which uh, was discovered simultaneously in LA and in, in Europe. Uh, and David Rawlings was involved uh, with, uh, with Owen Witte in, in uh, LA to identify BTK. And Edward Smith, uh, also a friend of mine uh, in Great Britain and Sweden. And now we can screen uh, for BTK by flow. And, and the treatment went from IM uh, IVIT to subcutaneous and even local by nebulization and oral uh, gamma globulin. And uh, uh, the treatment has been optimized by providing self infusion and by adjusting doses as needed and by giving intermittent antibiotics. So, a long story those, those uh, patients with antibody deficiency who learned in, in our clinical research center at the University of Washington, how to self-infuse uh, uh, IVIG. And the guy standing on the right, a uh, very nice person, he, he had actually uh, uh, um, a clotting uh, problem. He, uh, he had a factor eight deficiency, was with, treated with factor eight, got HIV and died a few years later very sad story, but uh, there are still some of them uh, who I follow who do self-infusion after uh, 40 years, IV. And I wanted to show you this uh, uh, very chronic ulcer, which is due to helicobacter. And I have seen these patients, usually they have a little lesion and it's usually on the lower leg and it starts out with uh, inflammation and it can end up like this. And if you don't recognize and give some proper treatment, uh, this is a terrible uh, chronic infection of the skin. Uh, that, that is uh, uh, the, a brain biopsy of a patient with XLA who uh, was shown to have a astrovirus infection. He went on to this progressive neurodegeneration at the age of 14 and died of it. And so uh, that virus, that astrovirus infects actually astrocytes in, in the brain. Uh, and so that, that is a complication, progressive neuro, neurodegeneration that was only discovered through a, a laboratory designed for bioterrorism in New York, which had the capability to identify almost any known uh, microorganism. So th these XLA patients can get problems which are difficult to solve. So what is Bruton's tyrosine uh, kinase or BTK? Uh, it's a cytoplasmic protein expressed in B cells, in monocytes, in platelets. It's essential for B cell development and function. And activation of BTK triggers a, can a, a cascade of signal e signaling events that go all the way through NF-kappa-B and uh, uh, to the expression of uh, other genes. And of course, it's either absent or non-functional in XLA. And I just wanted to show you uh, uh, that's uh, important for the diagnosis. So if you look for BTK in, in, by Western blot on the top, uh, you can see that it's present in B cells, monocytes, platelets, but not in T cells. And in the bottom is um, by flow you can very clearly see that B cells, monocytes, and platelets have BTK. And so if you look at patients with X-linked A-gamma globulinemia uh, and their mothers, you can see the following. Either they have no protein at, at all, when we call them type one, or they have decreased protein, type two, or they have normal amount of BTK, which is not functional. And if, if you look at the carrier females, you can very clearly differentiate them. Uh, and you have to do this in monocytes, of course, because patients have no B cells. And mothers, if you take mother's B cells because of the lionization, all the B cells will be normally expressing BTK. But if you take platelets or monocytes, you can see that the mothers have uh, two peaks, depending on how uh, their, their sons express a BTK. How do you determine that the protein is non-functional? because uh, they, uh, they cannot make antibodies and they have no B cells. So they're clinically, uh, uh, they clinically uh, 
um, X-linked A gamma global anemia, and you find a mutation. And these, these uh, uh, well, they have non-functional. They, they usually just have an amino acid substitution, which allows uh, the expression of the protein, you know, it's stable, but it doesn't do its job in, uh, in um, uh, maturate, maturating B cells from pro B cells, B cells to, to mature B cells. Interesting, it's a little like the abnormalities in hereditary angioedema. Yeah, it would be, it. yeah, yeah. It's, it's it, it, mo most of the patient, of, of the genetic defects who have this either completely absent or reduced or non-functional. And here, just to show you that is schematic, the different, the different domains of uh, BTK. And these are all mutations and they are from amino acid substitutions to deletions, to insertions, to stop codons. So anything you want is uh, present in these patients' uh, uh, mutations of BTK. And there I wanted to, uh, to show you uh, two or three uh, uh, pedigrees. This is actually a, a pedigree that goes back into uh, the, the century, the 19th century, where uh, we can identify retrospectively a carrier female. And if you go through uh, the, the um, generation with a defined X-linked carrier, which was born in 1918, I, I knew this lady, she had three sons. Two of them were alive. They were born after penicillin was around and they were at that time teenagers. Her older son, he died in, in 1944 before they in Montana had a penicillin. So he died early and he probably had the disease. And, he, and she had a daughter who subsequently had a, a son, so showing you know, the excellent inheritance. And then another uh, one of her sons, you can see he married an immunologically immolo normal woman, but uh, she, he had a carrier daughter. By definition, all his daughters should be carriers, and she has a son. So that that last son, he is uh, uh, he was born in in 1996. He is an X-ray technician. He was diagnosed at birth. He was treated right away. He is perfectly normal. And the the guy in, on the left, he was identified um, um, because he had two uncles who had the disease. He was identified early. He is now 50 and he's doing quite well because he was started on gamma globulin when he was two years, two years of age. So that tells you uh, that uh, you know, there seems to be an, an, an excellent inheritance. But now look at the top uh, on the second generation. Now that this parents of them, they died of old age. And there is one girl uh, which we con consider as being a carrier. And then there were eight boys, eight normal boys who survived. And so that suggests that there was a new mutation in most likely in that top male who uh, was normal, who uh, had a sperm that got mutated, or maybe it was the egg, and then their daughter was the first carrier and she uh, uh, initiated uh, this whole family tree. And uh, uh, that would be de novo mutations in lethal X-linked diseases, which was, which was pro proposed by Haldane, because the de novo mutations that are lethal, uh, they have to have new mutations at 30%, otherwise the disease would die out. So a very, very uh, clever, uh, 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 postulation. So, so because based on the no notion that one third of all X chromosomes are passed to male offspring, which all die. So that comes to 30%. And Haldane was right almost a hundred years ago. And there is one pedigree where we actually proved this. It's another uh, tree uh, where the first, uh, the first carrier is two, one. This, and if you if you do we, we did genetic studies in there she is a b and she got she got uh, the the uh, uh, the b has the mutations she got that from her dad so she uh, you you can see there's another girl with a b who is normal and she had she had uh, normal males so that two one 
that is a girl, the, the woman, and I met her when, when she had uh, the patient 3B, which was uh, at, at that time a teenager, uh, when she brought that to our clinic. So she is the originator of uh, these uh, uh, carrier females and patients with XLA in this family, again, showing that you have new mutations ha happening early. Why, why can't the mutation arise in the person themselves, two, one, why does it have to come from the prior generation? Because she she has it not in her ova. She has it in her, cells. yeah, so, so it must have been her, it must have been either the sperm or the egg. And, and the mutations occur usually because there are many more uh, divisions in the sperm, spermatogen, sperma, sperma, spermatogenia than, than in the ovaries. So it's usually the male. And there, I just wanted to show you the last few minutes, some, some of the characters. Uh, the, this is Helen Chapel from England, which teamed up with Charlotte Cunningham Randalls. Uh, they became good friends because they were both interested in CVID and they were actually starting the summer schools. And that is the first summer school I went to. Uh, it must have been in uh, some 20 years ago. And I still know two of them. The, the, the guy, he's uh, Israeli. And the girl on the right, she, her grandmother is from Sicilia. She just sent me a note that she bought a, a palace uh, uh, for $600,000 in, in Italy because nobody buys these things. So she is a pediatrician in, in, in Italy. And there, there is this class of, of uh, uh, European summer students uh, that was in Portugal. And it must have been sort of in, in 2001 or 2000. And then, and then we introduced it in, in the United States. And there are, uh, every year is a summer school in Florida. And I just wanted to show you some characters which you meet in meetings, you know, and just outside of the meeting room, uh, there is Raif Jihau, who is still alive, uh, Irvin Galfand, who is still alive in, in, in Denver. And then uh, uh, in the background with the dark hair, that, that is Fred, Fred uh, uh, Model. He is also still alive. And then uh, uh, Fred Rosen uh, from Boston, who passed away uh, uh, maybe 10 years ago. And there, there is Ralph and, uh, and, and, and on the left, and uh, Fred Rosen and Tom Waldman. All three have died, but uh, you know, that was uh, when they were uh, mentors and you oh, found them. The NIH. Hmm? Waldman was an NIH and he, he, he worked until his death. He was a very uh, um, famous um, NIH uh, icon who, who really supported NIH to, to, until his death. And so those are the ones where you rub your shoulders with. And that's an interesting, those are all young guys. I took the picture in one of the meetings and uh, no, Alain Fischer is there. Uh, uh, the next one is Amos, then Gigi in the, in the middle in front. Uh, Witte to, to Gigi's left side, he discovered together with, uh, with, with uh, David Rawlings, uh, BTK. And then in the background is Edward Smith, who also discovered uh, BTK. And then at the right hand, right hand side is a British transplanter, Andrew Kent, uh, uh, who and th that was when they were young and all of them became actually president of ESIT. All, all of them uh, at one point, except for uh, Witte. Not everybody listening knows what that society is. Yeah, as it is the European Society of Immune Deficiency, <coughs> uh, um, founded essentially by, by Alain Fischer. And all of them, uh, except when they became, uh, it's a two year rotation became, uh, and I, I captured them before they, they actually were, were ever, ever, uh, they, they were just the co fellows with me. And that's an interesting sto uh, story here. Uh, that's in Denver at, at, at an immunology meeting. And on the left-hand side, uh, you have a Palestinian. In the middle, you have an Israeli, Amos, and the Palestinian is, is Eli is his name. And on the, on the right-hand side, on the, on the right side, that's me. And you can imagine, uh, you know, we are drinking beer at a time when uh, you know the Germans and the Israelis uh, had just uh, made friendship again, uh, the the Palestinians were fighting the Israelis, so immunology is actually a political uh, instrument to get people together and to make them smile. You got you got the better dark beer. 
Yeah, yeah, I got, I got a, a I got a heavy, heavy weights. So do we still have? Uh, if you have a few minutes, I just want you to I show you. Yeah, keep going. This is too good to stop. <laughs> this, this is uh, Viscard in his older years who discovered um, uh, the Viscard Aldrich syndrome not as an immune deficiency but as a hematologic problem with platelets, and he realized that it was not ITP. So he said, you know, that's familial hypogamic, uh, familial uh, thrombocytopenia, but not, and in Germany, they called it uh, Morbus Valhofi. He said, no, it's not ITP. But then you see here, uh, if I go, I don't want to go through, but he draw this pedigree and he completely missed the genetics. He had two families and he thought it was a male who, who was, who was uh, uh, the carrier, but, uh, but uh, it's a female. And then that in the bottom is the family uh, which he described on, on the top. That was, was subsequently uh, genetically evaluated. So Beloratsky, uh, who is in Munich, he went back, dug out the, uh, the medical histories, went and started the family. And you can see the Kalyo females. And he, he found 5-1 in the bottom. That was a new patient and he studied, so they knew what the mutation was. The, the three boys who died, uh, we, we don't have the mutation, of course, they died. those were patients of Viscott. The, the three, the, the, the five one in the bottom, that was a patient of Beloratsky. And so you can see the pedigree, the screwed up pedigree from Viscott and the properly done pedigree from, uh, from Beloratsky. And then came, came uh, Aldrich, who ended up actually in Seattle. He, he, was, uh, he, he, came, he was in Minnesota, I think, but then he came to, to Seattle and worked with, uh, with uh, Shepard, uh, no, with, um, uh, with uh, David Shurtleff uh, in, in uh, congenital defects. And he, he, and he was a young physician, he got this pedigree of a family uh, and he published it and you can see all these males. And he, he told me the story, he was talking to uh, the index case mother, I, I can see which one it is. And there was in the background in the room where the grandmother and he talked with the mother of this kid who had thrombocytopenia. And uh, he also realized that it was not ITP and he tried to figure out, get more information. And then the grandmother said, like all the others. And that is a family that immigrated from Holland to Minnesota and that came out. And then he described the disease uh, first independently from Wiscott. When he submitted his paper, a reviewer said, I think there was a guy in Germany who had the similar disease. And so then they, they figured it out. They cited Wiscott and now it's called Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. Okay, immunoglobulin. I think we, we should stop here. I just wanted to, it's, you know, it's an important uh, aspect, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, history. So uh, passive immunity by bearing in Kit Kitasado, uh, you know, two centuries ago, uh, serum, human serum prevents measles. That was discovered also in the 19th century. Then came Decelius uh, with his apparatus that Edwin, uh, Edwin Korn, uh, plasma fractionation, and then fractionation two prevents measles, and then uh, fractionation two was used to treat hepatitis, uh, RSV, parvovirus, enteroviruses, and then it entered uh, the field of antibody deficiency. And I think that's where I should stop uh, my reminiscence. And all of these uh, took time, and you can see how slowly it started from the from the Greeks. It took many, many centuries to get to the concept of immunology, how it works, how it can go wrong, and how we potentially can fix it. You know, uh, I'm sitting here across from Hans, and I can tell the 50 or so people that are listening, you'll never hear a better talk than that. You people were really privileged to hear <laughs> what, what I yeah. think was a, a brilliant discourse. I thank you. Um, well, you have to hang in there for long enough, and then you you know you get the perspective of what actually happened, and that's important to 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 think about because it's it's going to to turn young people on 
to uh, carry on and to to show them that uh, you know you you build on your ancestors and uh, eventually I you know I just wonder what this field looks like in in 2050 and 2080. You know what strikes me is um, this is talk about adaptive immunity almost essentially and when I was you know almost the same age you are Hans we always focused on this and it seems only in the last maybe two decades that we have the knowledge about the uh, innate immune system, yep. the non-adaptive immune system has come equally far in our understanding. We almost sort of ignored that. Yep. Yep. When I was training, we never thought, maybe thought about CGI. Uh, CGD, about, yeah. CGD, yeah, CGD, but what? that was about it. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, if you look at uh, the uh, catalog of immune deficiencies, uh, which is uh, published every two years by this IUIS committee, there are more and more uh, chapters of patients who have innate immune deficiencies, uh, you know, from complement, uh, uh, neutrophils, uh, uh, all these signaling abnormalities uh, that uh, that result in abnormal cytokine production. So I think you are quite right. Uh, that is a, a field that needs a lot more attention. And it would be also a field for, for a correction, for treatment, you know, that you can influence these innate immune defects, either by transplantation for CGD, but also by monoclonal antibodies. That uh, that will or or, or products like uh, CTLA4, uh, uh, IgG, adapt that 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 will uh, influence the um, that that will influence how these diseases uh, present clinically. Uh, well, we're at eight o'clock, uh, but if anybody's got a question, you know. Uh, or anybody wants to stay on longer and ask Hans questions, I'm sure uh, he'd be happy to take questions um, or type them into a chat box. We'll have to have you back because uh, you didn't finish and there's more of his story to tell and we have to have you tell it um, because you've got marvelous stories to relate. Yeah, some some of the stories, you know, you can actually uh, you you have to eliminate you have to to deduct the names of who did what and uh, you know I'm not sure everybody understood why Bob Good didn't get the Nobel Prize. You know, young people, you might tell it in a little more detail what was actually happened in his career. Yep. I remember that vividly. Yep, yep. So you know, Bob Good was. He was such a good mentor. He would never think that somebody would cross him. And so he heard about this uh, dermatologist in Stanford who cultured tissue and uh, was able, according to his presentations, to uh, transfer organs. Skin. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he tried all kinds. But then Bob Good said, you know, you, you are a dermatologist. Come to me and we work it out with, uh, with uh, mice. And he presented him in one of his famous meetings. Bob Good had symboling, and he said, "You know, he's going to solve the problem of uh, of uh, transplantation, allogeneic transplantation." And so he went with Bob, uh, Sloan Kettering, and created mice. His job was to transplant skin from a black mouse onto a genetically different white mouse. And and he worked on it, and uh, now Bob Good wanted to to I think they published it, and they had pictures of a mouse with uh, black black skin, and so uh, one day uh, uh, a janitor came in that uh, the vivarium, and uh, uh, there was a, a mouse which was dirty, and he took some alcohol and and cleared the dirt off, and then the the color went off, that black spots went off, and so uh, he told Bob Good, and that was the downfall of Simmerling because he he used a a, a black marker, marker to uh, induce uh, the successful transplant 
against uh, the HLA uh, barrier of these mice. And, and uh, that cost, uh, I'm sure, cost him the, the Nobel Prize, but also, you know, he, he lost his bearing yeah, after that. Career. Yeah, he, he went through Kansas and then he went to Florida and built up, built up a, 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 good, a, a good unit in St. Petersburg. But then uh, when, after he died, it's completely disintegrated. Yeah, and he, uh, he was just a, a guy who would never think that somebody would uh, do, do a thing. Yeah. Um, well, we have a comment up there. What an amazing talk connecting our rapidly evolving science and immunology with the history. Uh, I feel the same. So thank you. Um, a brilliant talk, Hans. Uh, I apologize I didn't have you do this many. <laughs> We've been doing these sessions uh, since I was a fellow with Paul Van Arsdale. And yeah, he asked, yeah. me, asked me to do this. It's like 45 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I waited too long to invite you. No, I mean, uh, it, those were important 40 years <laughs> in the, in, in the development of uh, at least PID, which we now, now call IEI. Inborn errors of immunity. All right, uh, to the fellows who are listening, I'll try and get on with you. Um, if I can get my computer to work here in, in Children's. So thanks again. We'll uh, shut this down. Okay, thank you guys. It was a pleasure to present these things to you.